Well, uh, you read them in the Detroit Free Press. You see him regularly writing about uh, things automotive. He's Mark Phelan, and he joins us this half hour on the program from the Free Press. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Richard. Thank you for your time today. It's nice to talk to you again. Always a pleasure. So, uh, first thing on our list has to do with uh, this whole Ford Motor Company announcement that they're going to move small car production to Mexico. And uh, it came up in the middle of the political race, of course, and then it came up again during the debate the other night uh, when uh, uh, Donald Trump was using it as evidence that uh, something's wrong with the employment picture in this country by saying Ford's shipping those jobs away. And I sat there thinking... Boy, didn't Mark Fields say that those workers were going to be assigned to other jobs? And then yesterday, floating around on social media, what appeared to be a Ford Motor Company graphic on Facebook saying exactly that. Is that true? That is exactly true. Uh, Ford is, is moving production of the Focus to Mexico, to a new plant they're building, but they're replacing that production in Michigan at the plant that currently builds Focus with a new generation of the Ranger pickup and the Bronco SUV, which are both vehicles that actually should sell better than the Focus. And, you know, I would think if you're if you're working in the plant, you'll have a better chance of picking up some overtime as well. So mm. it's really a, pretty much a good news story for the plant, but Mr. Trump didn't uh, get the nuance of it, unfortunately. So what's the climate around small cars these days? It seems like we're just not selling a lot of them. No, the, the market has shifted away from them for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one fuel has been inexpensive for a while, and it looks like it's going to stay inexpensive for a while. And two, fuel economy technology has improved so much that people can get within a mile or two of, of the you know, fuel economy of a very efficient small car in a small SUV like a Ford Escape or, or a Buick Encore mm -hmm. and get more vehicle, they think, and also get a, a higher seating position, which lots of people like because it gives you a better view when you're out on the highway. So small cars like the traditional you know, Focus are, are losing ground in the market, and small SUVs are picking up on them. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute, including the notion that, uh, for example, Chrysler... Sergio Marchione has said, we don't even want to build small cars anymore there. We'll talk about that and more coming up in just a minute on WBCK. We're chatting this half hour with Mark Phelan, auto writer at the Detroit Free Press. You know, it's interesting what you said. Gas prices are cheap, so <laughs> we're not buying smaller cars. I, I actually had this conversation not long ago with our friends at Lakeview Ford here in Battle Creek who say they, they see people, when the gas prices go up, they bring their trucks in. <laughs> And trade them in and buy something small. And then when the prices go down, they come back and switch back. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's the way it works. People have figured out that a, a car is not a long-term a long -term commitment anymore. You can get the one that you need when you need it. Well, and they sure do that. What is this about uh, Sergio Marchione saying Chrysler doesn't even want to build small cars anymore? Is he serious? He is. He is. And if you're Chrysler, it, it's frankly... You know, not a bad idea, because they have not been good at building small cars for a long time. The last one that they had that people really got excited about was, was the Chrysler PT Cruiser, which was new 15 years ago or more, mm -hmm. and, and they haven't had, had a small car that people would pay a premium for since then. So the, the Dodge Dart, which they introduced two or three years ago to, to great fanfare, actually is ceasing production at the end, by the end of this month, and later this year, they'll stop production of the midsize Chrysler 200. So Chrysler will not be building any small or midsize cars anywhere, and they're hoping that they can find some other company to build cars for them, so their dealers will have some some small cars to sell. But Chrysler is shifting its focus very much to small SUVs because you can make more money on them. Mm -hmm. They just yesterday, in fact, uh, revealed pictures of the replacement for the Jeep Compass, a, a compact SUV that looks like a, a scaled-down Grand Cherokee. It's going to go on sale next year. That is really interesting. Is that new territory for a car company to say, yeah, we'll have a small car or two, but we're not going to build it? A any volunteers? <laughs> it is. It's, it's, 
It's a new business model, and it's an interesting one. Uh, we don't know yet if, if Chrysler is making a smart move in the long run, but certainly, you know, for now, they will make more money with the SUVs that they build. And most companies, frankly, are trying to find ways to build more profitable small SUVs and trucks in America and shift production of less profitable cars to other places. Chrysler is the only one of the American-based companies that still makes a, that will still make a compact car in the United States by the end of uh, this year with, with the Chevy Cruze. Mm-hmm. Well, it's too bad about the Dodge Dart. That that name has such history in, in uh, Chrysler's past that uh, you would like to have seen it do something nice. Yeah, and forgive me, I think I misspoke and said Chrysler builds the Chevy Cruze, and of course that's General Motors. Yeah. I, I apologize for that mistake if I made it. Well, uh, what is the employment climate in the auto industry now? I mean, when, when Donald Trump stands up and says, you know, we have problems in industries like uh, automotive and in Detroit, does that resonate among employees in the industry? Not particularly. I, I mean, in, in competition is incredibly intense, of course, and I don't think there's anybody who's sleeping easy and thinking they can afford to, to just kick back and relax on the job. But uh, Michigan's unemployment rate, 4.5 percent, you know, the last time it was announced a couple of weeks ago, is lower than the national average. And the auto industry in general is hiring and uh, giving raises and, and pretty good uh, job security. Uh, so it, it's a, a narrative that's stuck in the past that I think suits some politicians more than it actually fits the reality. Hmm. You know, we, we check on the manufacturing economy uh, fairly regularly in West Michigan with a, a periodic economic report from a, a local analyst. And he says, watch out, because the auto industry is just cruising right now. Uh, and so the concern becomes, when will it slow down? Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Um, it, it, it's something that you've got to keep an eye on, because the last downturn was so horrendously deep during the financial crisis, we've been regaining sales as we recovered for about five straight years. That's an unusually long period. So there's going to come a plateau. Uh, the economic forecasts that I see suggest that it'll be a plateau rather than a dip, though. And that's the kind of thing that companies can manage fairly easily. Mm-hmm. So that there's people, people have got their eyes open, but there's not deep concern, I wouldn't say, at this point, because they do think that, that the economy overall is running fairly well at the moment. So when we say that the uh, the industry is doing extremely well, does that mean that folks looking for a car should expect to find fewer incentives? Very likely, yes. One of the things that the companies got into toward the end of the last cycle was putting very heavy incentives on vehicles because they cut back on, on you know production. They shut down old plants that they didn't need to. There's less overcapacity these days, so companies are able to offer smaller incentives, which is good for their bottom line, but it means that the deals for consumers are not quite as, as easy to find and as rich as they used to be. Mm-hmm. Mark Phelan's with us from the Detroit Free Press. In a moment, we'll talk about the uh, next uh, North American car, truck, and SUV of the year, which we don't know what they are yet, but Mark is among that elite group of journalists that helped decide that and the announcement made at the North American International Auto Show in January in Detroit. So we'll talk about the progress of that coming up in just a moment. WBCK, a few more minutes with Mark Phelan, auto writer at the Detroit Free Press. And, well, you hear about it when uh, January comes around and all the auto show buzz in Detroit is happening, an announcement about the North American car, truck, and SUV of the year. These are considered to be esteemed honors because... It's a group of journalists that actually decide that, and Mark is one of them. How does it work, Mark, anyway? Well, there's about 60 of us who uh, work throughout the United States and Canada at all different kinds of media, and we test just about every new vehicle that comes out every year, and we winnow them down uh, to the finalists. Right now we're at the step where we just announced the semifinalists. Uh, We're going to test those over again over the course of the next month or so, get together in Michigan to uh, to uh, give a, a look to them all, and then vote to figure out what are the uh, finalists for car, SUV, and truck of the year in November, and we'll announce it in January at the North American International Auto Show. Hmm. So this must be a big group, then, of vehicles that you have to whittle down. It is, absolutely. We 
start off looking at every vehicle that's introduced. By the time we've got the semifinalists, we're down to about 15 cars, 10 SUVs, and only four pickups, which gets back to what we were saying earlier about how the market is uh, shifting toward SUVs. The, this is the first year, in fact, that we've had a separate award for SUV of the year. It used to be lumped in with pickups, mm-hmm. but we broke it off and gave it its own award because there's such intense interest with customers. That's interesting. So as you narrow this down, you'll have finalists. And how do you decide then uh, which ones win? There must be an intense criteria here. There are, and it's a group of different criteria. Value, innovation, uh, what a vehicle means to a brand when there's a vehicle that kind of redefines how we look at a brand. Some of the things we're going to be seeing this year uh, will be uh, new alternative uh, fuel vehicles are, are going to play a, a large role in the list, like the Chevy Bolt, the new electric car. Uh, also, uh, the Lincoln Continental, which is Lincoln's attempt to sort of regain relevance in, in the world of uh, modern luxury cars, uh, and, and also uh, cars with autonomous uh, uh, driving features like the Mercedes E-Class and Volvo S90. So all of the trends that are going on in the auto industry are kind of embodied in the vehicles that we're considering. Mm -hmm. Boy, that Continental has a huge buzz. You suppose that has to do with the value, the brand value of that name? Uh, Yes, and and the fact that Lincoln is a, a, a brand that has got great historic relevance, but it's sort of slipped out of the frontier of the auto industry in, in the last few years. And we've seen Cadillac reinvent itself. And the, the Continental is the first really big step for, toward Lincoln trying to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's tremendous interest in that car. You talked about autonomous vehicles. Is this going to be a, a, a fad or are we really going to buy cars that drive themselves? I think we're going to do it. And I think that it's going to be a great way in some in some a great thing in some ways we don't even think about. Uh, if you you know consider older people and people with limited mobility, this will give them a greater access to the world, greater opportunity to remain independent. I think than they've had in the past. Uh, so I think I think it's going to be a great thing, uh, and it's definitely coming within five or six years. We'll probably see some vehicles that can at least do all the driving for themselves once you're on the highway. Wow. And, you know, we hear a little bit about uh, the uh, incidents that have happened at times with these things, but this is part of the R&D of this process, isn't it? It is, and it's probably the most intensively uh, studied R&D process in the the global auto industry these days, even as much as, as, as electric vehicles are. And there's a lot of stuff going on in Michigan to try to make sure there's this state and this region becomes one of the central places that that development takes place uh, because it is going to be one of the big drivers for the auto industry going forward. Very interesting. So you said Bronco and Ranger are coming back. That's where we started That's all this. Expect. Ford has not officially announced it, but everybody uh, would be shocked if within the next year or so they don't say those are going into the plant that is currently building focuses which are the cars that are being shipped down to Mexico instead. Mm -hmm. When we say Bronco, are we talking about uh, a modern version of the Bronco, or are we talking about a retro style? Uh, You know, we haven't seen it yet, but I think I'd I'd be surprised if it's not modern. Um, It's another aspect of the interest in in SUVs. Um, You know, Chrysler is doing so very well with the Jeep brand, and Ford wants something that can cash in on that, but be more modern, more fuel efficient than the old Bronco they used to build. So it'll be a uh, Bronco in, in name, but uh, new in all other ways. Interesting. All right. Well, we always appreciate the time. We'll be reading, Mark. Thank you so much, Richard. <laughs> all right. Mark Phelan, Detroit Free Press auto writer on WBCK.